Wales is a beautiful country, but it's also a dark land. In this series, we joined retired Chief Constable Jackie Roberts as she revisits some of the country's most notorious murders. OK, good morning, team. Nice to see you all. She is assisted by a team of leading experts. Together, they will apply modern policing techniques to examine a series of disturbing murder cases. These include cold cases, the reinvestigation of which may lead to the identification of a prime suspect, and solved cases that are considered landmark police investigations which continue to impact on the way murder is detected in the UK today. On the morning of the 7th of December 1989, workmen laying pipes at a house in Cardiff made a ghoulish discovery. Oh, shut it down, yeah? The body was found in the garden of the house yesterday afternoon. It was in a shallow grave and wrapped in a carpet. The victim would eventually be identified as 15-year-old Karen Price, and the police investigation to bring her killer to justice would become known as one of the most innovative in British criminal history. It was a highly unusual murder, where detectives had to identify not only the killer, but the victim too. At the incident room established in the citadel of the old Swansea Library, the Darkland team revisit this extraordinary investigation. They are headed up by retired Chief Constable Jackie Roberts and retired Chief Inspector Paul Bethel. So this is the case of uh, Karen Price, a particularly interesting case. Um, what we knew at the start was she was missing um, going back to July 1981. Karen was a 15-year-old girl. She was in care. She was actually in an assessment centre at the time she went missing. Um, she had a, quite a troubled background. She'd been in care for a number of years, since the age of 10, and she'd gone missing on numerous previous occasions. And she disappears off the face of the earth, and she's never seen again. It's over eight years later when some workmen uh, working digging in the back garden of a, of a, a property discover a, a rolled up carpet and of course when the carpet is, is actually removed from the ground the skeletal remains of an individual are found inside and that's where the investigation then commences. Okay, and quite interesting, this gap between 1981 and 1989, her discovery uh, of, of the remains, how you've explained. And so I think it would be useful now just to get the interpretation of the team uh, on the issues that uh, unfolded in those early stages. So Sam, from a geographical profile perspective, what is it that interests you about the case of Karen Price? The key here is going to be to look very closely at Karen's day-to-day -day life and her routine activities. And her lifestyle may well have taken her into risky places. We know that some places are inherently more risky than others. I think we may just reveal how, where and when she came into contact with her killer. Uh, Paul, if I can come to you and your assessment from an offender profiling perspective so far. I don't have a psychological profile, as it were, at the moment. What I do have are a number of questions. I very much want to know who this young girl was. I don't mean just in terms of a vulnerable 15-year-old, but Karen. Not just the general, well, she was unruly, she was difficult. I want to know how. I want to know what it was about her that brought her into care. And then crucially, I want to know why she left, why she took herself away. Was she running away from a nightmare or was she rushing towards some sort of dream? Makes a big difference. So Nell, what can you add to the picture in relation to Karen Price? Well, there's a slight overlap between what Paul's going to be looking at and what I'd like to look at in terms of, I'd like to look at the historical context. I'd like to look at Karen in 1981, what life was like for a child from her background and, you know, with the vulnerabilities that she had and therefore how she could disappear seemingly without trace, without people kind of fighting for her story to be, you know, front page of the newspapers. So I'd like to look at that more. So look at the, the context of it, look at how the press were covering cases and what made the press decide whether they were going to cover um, a missing persons case or not. 
Uh, so, Jack, you've joined us today because you've already got a connection with the uh, Karen Price case, and I understand that you've been in contact with uh, Professor Bernard Knight, who was a pathologist in this case. It was a real privilege to interview uh, Professor Bernard Knight, who spoke about this case because it was vivid in his memory. So that's a useful start from the team, but I think now what we need to do is to get out there and identify what happened and how this actual investigation unfolded. Paul Bethel heads to the scene of the crime and is met by retired Detective Sergeant Jeff Norman, who back in 1981 was one of the first police officers on the scene. Well, Jeff, we're here in Cardiff City Centre uh, Fitzhammer in Bankland, right opposite the stadium, the National Stadium. Now, I know you were a police officer and a detective in Cardiff for many years. You are a city cop, as we call that. Back in the early 80s, what type of area was it, Jeff? It's quite a contrast because so much of what we see today is how it was back then. And yet on the other side of the road, you can see there's so many new developments. But it was, it was a rough old place, if I'm honest. Obviously, it's so close to the city centre. There were people coming back and forth the whole time because it is a, you know, it's a through route and it used to attract all kinds of people. Yeah. And, and this is the house, Jeff, number 27, uh, Fitzhamon Embankment. Now, this is the house where Karen actually died. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's two properties, actually. 27 and 29 were joined together uh, and managed as one big property, but there were lots of separate um, bed sits. Uh, within the property itself. Yeah, well, multi-occupancy, I think, they, they yes. refer to them. Yes, so, so they would have been flats and bed sets further up in the property and alongside. On all floors. It was um, a very, very busy house. Yeah, and, and very much all the buildings in the street are very much like it then. Yes, that's right. That most of the houses along here uh, were set up in a similar fashion. Yes. So lots of different people coming and going uh, and a very, very busy area. Now, there is access to the back of the property, Jeff, from here, down a lane at the site. Yeah, into the garden where some of the events took place. Shall we have a little look in the garden? Yeah. The remains of body were found just before Christmas by workmen renovating a terraced house opposite the National Rugby Stadium in Cardiff. They were trussed up with wire in a carpet in a shallow grave. It's 33 years since Karen was found, uh, December 1989. Has the premises changed much? Yeah, it's very, very different to how it was on that evening. Um, you didn't have this concrete hard standing that is here now. Laying pipes or something, there was some sort of uh, sewage works going on, that type of thing? Yeah, they were renewing some of the, uh, the waste uh, water pipes and, and what have you. And it was the workmen, of course, who, who made the uh, this, the discovery. And of course they're using diggers. Yeah, they hit an obstruction. Um, obviously went to see what it was, and that's when they decided this doesn't look right, uh, and called the police, yeah. Well, as always it was, we was reducing the level for drainage on the side of the house, and we come across a carpet, which we dragged out, and found out there was a body inside it once we opened it. I was the first on the scene with a detective inspector. By that point, the carpet had been unfilled a little bit, uh, and immediately you could see there were bones and it was obviously highly suspicious. So we decided we need to stop. There was evidence to be gathered uh, and the usual scene preservation kicks in and that's when we start contacting scenes of crime and forensic scientists. I mean, little did we know at that point um, what we were dealing with. So, and you can never second guess what you actually are dealing with um, and that's why you need to get those experts in. Uh, to do that work for you uh, and that's when the investigation starts. So did anything particularly strike you about the location of Karen's remains? Yeah, I mean what was particularly striking was the fact that um, where the bundle had been found was so close to the property. Um, it was literally five or six feet away from the back door of what would have been in those days the, the basement flat and that seemed to me to be quite odd because it's quite a large area. It could have been buried anywhere within this area but somebody had chosen to put that uh, so close to the property. But when I think back to the events of that evening and uh, the impact that has had, um, not only on, on my career, but the advances that that led to in investigations 
nationally okay. and internationally. The uh, techniques that they used. The techniques, the different ologists that became involved, that some of which I'd never even heard of, yeah. all of whom were used to assist us in the investigation. Yeah. South Wales police were now faced with a double murder mystery to solve. They had to try and catch the killer, but not before they had first identified who the victim was. Dental experts are now studying the remains with a pathologist, but the cause of death still remains a mystery, as does her identity. The man leading the inquiry suspects the woman may have been murdered, but can't officially say so yet. We don't know the cause of death, but the circumstances surrounding these remains leaves much to be desired, and it is very suspicious indeed. Is it a murder investigation? Well, I'm not calling it murder at the moment until we can find a cause of death, but because the body was wrapped in a carpet, because somebody has obviously taken time to bury it so that it should never be found, then of course at this time we have to treat it very seriously indeed. If the woman was murdered, she'll be added to disturbing crime statistics for the Riverside and Grangetown areas of Cardiff, where there have been at least 15 murders in the last decade. Retired Scotland Yard detective Jackie Moulton heads to speak to the first person the police called once the crime scene had been secured. Home Office forensic pathologist, Professor Bernard Knight. Bernard, in your very long and fascinating career as a pathologist, where you've done over 25,000 post-mortems, where does the case of Karen Price sit in terms of interest? Well, Karen Price is uh, top of the pops, really, for uh, uh, actual quality um, in all those post-mortems. Uh, this one had more teamwork and varied opinions from different specialists than any other case I've done. You got the call to go to Fitzhamron Embankment. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and what did you find when you got there? Well, the usual sort of organised chaos around the crime scene. And what are you specifically looking for in situ? Well, first of all, have a look around and get the feel of it, so to speak. Once the thing was unwrapped, then I get down to a set routine, really, for bones. But the first thing is, are they human? And this obviously was. The second thing is, male or female? And just a quick glance, the pelvis and the skull. In tell, a situ, you could tell in, in a situ. situ. Yeah. Yeah. And then age, uh, well... At the scene, I couldn't tell much, but I could see that the bones were not totally fused at the junctions of things like knees and elbows and whatever, which means it's a young person. I made a sort of inspired guess at about late teens. And the next thing is hair. There's some hair there, which is fair. So it's a, a girl, probably in her late teens, and with fair hair. So that's the first, even at the scene, you can do that much. Okay. What's your next step? Because obviously you can't find the cause of death, can you? No. I mean, if she'd been shot through the head or a head beaten in or stabbed through a bone, one could tell. But as there was nothing except bones, uh, some people make a lot of fuss about the hyoid bone in the neck, which can get broken in strangulation. But she was 15 and it doesn't break, it just bends. So I had no data to work on. Back in 1989, the autopsy on Karen's remains brought the police no closer to identifying her. If the case had been investigated now, detectives may have turned to a modern policing tool for assistance, geographic profiling. Just looking at the map here from, again, your expertise, what is this telling us? So uh, this is unusual um, because for a long time there was no murder investigation yeah. until her body was discovered so we had um, we had no location to base uh, an investigation so the first thing to say is and it's not covered on this map this map centers very much on cardiff city yeah. center for a reason which i'll come on to but she did actually go missing um, some way further north in Pontypris, where she was at an assessment center yeah. um, but her activities we know through looking at her lifestyle and, and what she enjoyed doing. She, she spent a lot of time in Cardiff city centre, often in public open spaces. If you actually look at the map there, what you'll see the green circles there are locations we know Karen frequented 
we've got the railway station where there was actually a bus station there where she spent a great deal of time along with other young people. She spent a lot of time in spaces that probably were quite risky places yeah. because they were quite transient, um, where people were coming and going. There's no real responsible owners of those locations and so they would have brought about risk and, and we know by looking at the way offenders actively search for victims that they can often be magnets for predators. So we're starting to establish her activity space we call it in criminal psychology. But back in 1989 detectives were left to rely on more traditional methods to solve the murder. Make us some inquiries into the people that lived at 29 Fitzsimmons Embankment. But very quickly after the discovery of Karen's body, the police investigation found itself at a standstill. Professor Knight's pathology report revealed that the victim was a girl of around 15 years of age, and that she had probably been murdered around 1981. It wasn't much to go on, but the police now knew not just the victim's age, but height, sex, and approximate date of death. At the incident room in Norbury Road in Cardiff, a search was made of missing persons files, and they began the laborious task of tracing everyone who'd lived in any of the dozen bedsits at 27 and 29 Fitzhamon Embankment, where the body had been found. But all records of missing persons from around that time drew a blank. The hope was that an appeal to the public may bring more information. Crime historian Dr. Nell Darby heads to the archive. She is interested to learn more about how newspapers at the time reported the discovery of Karen's body, and in particular, the fact that no one came forward to identify her. This is one of those cases that I find really upsetting. I think when you realise that the murder victim has been known in her lifetime as little bit nobody, I think that kind of sums up how she was seen as a victim as well. Um, she wasn't seen as important or her life as having any worth and given that she was a 15 year old girl with a very troubled background I just find it really upsetting actually what happened to her um, and the fact that her body went unfound for eight years. Karen is what we describe today as a vulnerable teenager. She had been in care till the age of 10. She was then in a residential children's home. She had kind of regular assessment centres designed to kind of keep an eye on her, if you like, but she would abscond from those. She was living kind of um, quite an itinerant life, really. You know, there, there wasn't much um, attempt being made to kind of keep her within education, to make sure she was okay. The care system certainly let Karen down. But I acknowledge the, the problems in the system as well and the fact that then as now, if you've got a strong-willed 15-year-old girl who's not had that kind of stable family background and they say, right, I'm leaving or I'm going off and doing this, it's very hard for you to kind of force them to stay put. So you could be doing your best at Green Hill School where she went or at the children's home where she stayed. You could do your best to try and keep her there and keep her on the straight and narrow. But if she says, I'm going off or just disappears, you've got limited resources and ability to do anything about that. And so therefore she was left to her own devices a lot. She'd go kind of roaming around Cardiff you know, just trying to find things to do every day. So kind of, you know, hanging out at the bus station, going to various cafes, mixing with other vulnerable teenagers. It's looking for um, anything to do, I think, really. Despite extensive appeals to the press, the police investigation ground to a standstill. With all the other avenues explored, the decision was then made to attempt to use a technique previously only used in archaeology, facial reconstruction modelling. The thinking was that if the police couldn't put a name to the skeleton, maybe a forensic artist could put a face to the skull. Richard Neve was making a name as a forensic sculptor. Based at Manchester University, he had used his artistic skills to recreate the lifelike faces of mummified Egyptians. He was asked by South Wales police to use those same skills on the skeleton in the carpet. 
What we're trying to do is to produce a face which is going to be very similar to the kind of face that individual had when they were alive and that when it circulated in the right area that somebody who knew that individual will have their memory jogged. Now, nearly 90 years of age, Richard has agreed to grant the Darkland team what he says will be his final interview on the case. Jackie Roberts heads to his workshop in Kent to meet him. So, Richard, you've been involved in forensic facial reconstruction for many years. Can you just explain to me how you became involved with the Karen Price case? Uh, it's like all these things, and the phone rings. And in this case, it was a police officer down in Wales, and they said, we have been told that you reconstruct faces and we've got a skull, and please will you do it? It's as simple as that. And they sent the skull up to the studio at Manchester University, um, together with the reports, which of course are critical, from the pathologist and the odontologist, giving you an indication of age, and sex and ethnicity. Those are the three things you need. And it is quite a technical piece of work that you're undertaking then, oh, really. Yes, it's, you're absolutely right. It is a technical exercise, not an artistic exercise. You've got your skull and uh, there's nothing you can do to change that. Yeah. And the pegs inserted indicate the average thickness of soft tissue that you are going to find at those particular points of the face. So that when you build the soft tissue over it, you are not just making it up. And I suppose in your mind's eye, you've not got any idea of what that end product is going to look like no. until it emerges. No, well, that's absolutely right. It's, it's just got to grow from the surface of the skull outwards of its own accord. The one thing that we did have with Karen Price, which was uh, um, not always there, it was hair. So we knew approximately the length of the hair and uh, the, the sort of nature of the hair. Uh, Richard, from the time that the skull was delivered to you then, um, what was the time scale that you were working to to try and create this face? Uh, it normally at that time took about five days to build a face and they wanted the reconstruction ASAP and they took me quite literally. So I started on the Monday. On the Friday, they rang up and uh, said, are you finished? I said, well, I'm just doing the, we're on our way now. They were halfway up the motorway when they rang and they arrived that afternoon. They took a lot of photographs and in most cases, that's the end of it. Yeah. Sometimes don't hear any more about it at all. Richard Neve's artistry was now to be put to the test. Could anyone put a name to the face he'd so painstakingly reconstructed? It became the focus of a massive publicity campaign. South Wales Police took Richard's sculpture and made it available to the national press, where it featured in a series of appeals. You may not have known this girl by name, but do you recall her from the early 1980s? I remember at the time myself that it caused quite a, a bit of a, a interest. There was huge media interest from all over the country. We had several phone calls, uh, and two phone calls in particular, um, named the same person. During her time in the care system, Karen had been in close contact with a number of social workers. One of the calls came from a social worker who worked at the children's home, but there was no missing person form. Um, from the, the social services home. So how do you link that suggestion of who she might be to the actual remains? Well, that was the, the question. How were we going to prove yeah. that that was who she was? And the only way we could do that, we thought, was through DNA. DNA was still very much in 1890, very much in its infancy. Yes, it was, very much so. Uh, and that was when we found some groundbreaking work that was being done um, in the University of Oxford where they were looking to see if they could extract DNA samples from bones, which is, of course, all that we had. So you have the DNA work. I presume you did you go to see her parents, to track down her parents? We spoke to her parents as well. We took blood samples, which gave us the match to the DNA that had been extracted from the bones. And we now knew that that person was Karen Price. So you've now got a 100% 
identification. Yeah, we succeeded in our first objective, which was to identify that person. And that really was shocking that nobody had missed her. Why hadn't somebody missed her? Why hadn't a call been recorded somewhere to report her missing in the subsequent years? But there was nothing. Back at the incident room, the team explored the most striking aspect of the case and how Karen could have remained missing and unreported for so long. So Nell, what can you add to the picture in relation to the Karen Price case? So today it seems kind of um, unheard of that you would get a girl of her age going missing and then not to be this kind of flood of press stories of media coverage you know, a kind of a fight to find her. And you see that with recent cases where families go out and put up posters or they'll kind of do a press conference on the anniversary of a child's disappearance. Um, if you haven't got that kind of stable family that are going to do that for you, what happens? She did not have people fighting her cause. So the press didn't know about her in order to write about her. Karen was 15 when this photograph was taken, a few months before she disappeared. She'd been in care since she was 10, but in July 1981, she absconded from the Mysa Eglis Assessment Centre in Pontypridd. Very little is known about what happened to her from then on. This is Big Asti's Cafe, just in front of the bus station. Did you eat here in the summer of 1981? When Karen had run away from homes before, and she'd done so several times, she often came here for a coffee. Social workers who had worked with Karen had helped identify her, but her killer was still at large. Once again, the police turned to the media for help. The investigation took yet another bizarre twist. Hey, I knew her. A Cardiff man watching one of the TV appeals called in to say he'd once been a friend of Karen's. I used to hang around with her. Detectives are very anxious for any help they can get from anyone. This man was Idris Ali, one of the men who played a part in Karen's death. Idris Ali was watching Crime Watch and saw this, this kind of reconstruction, recognises her and has to say to the person sitting next to him, you know, I knew her. Hello. Following his call to the police, Idris Ali was asked to attend Riverside Police Station to share the information in person. He was interviewed by Detective Sergeant Jeff Norman. We know from what Idris Ali told me that she was first met by him at the Central Square. Um, Idris Ali himself at that time was only 15 or 16 years old and he was one of those that would hang around the bus station. It was that kind of a, an area of the city centre. It, it, was, it did provide a focus for a lot of these children. When we went live on Crime Watch, he was amongst friends watching that and he wanted to be able to say, hey, I know this girl, I can do something about this, I can help the police. And that's when he made the call. But he did give various accounts, um, but as I say, he was, he was certainly looking to become somebody. He wanted to be the centre of attention and he couldn't help himself, he had, to, he had to make that call. During his interview with Jeff Norman, Idris Ali told detectives that he had been the one to invite Karen back to a party at a flat rented by a local man called Alan Charlton, a man with a fearsome reputation. He became of great interest to us when we discovered that he used to live in the uh, basement flat near to where the body had been found um, at the time that we believed that she'd been killed. Um, Alan Charlton was a, uh, was a bouncer on nightclub doors uh, in the Cardiff city centre. Um, a man for the ladies, People thought a lot of him um, and looked up to him because he was the kind of character who demanded respect. We know that Idris Ali looked up to Charlton, saw him as somebody that he aspired to be. Alan Charlton was having a party and he wanted some girls to come along. And Idris Ali was very keen to please people and brought two girls back to the flat. And of course, nobody knows they're there, Jeff, really, do they? Nobody knows, apart from Ali and Charlton, nobody knows those two young girls are in that flat. No, and that's, that's the problem. They are that vulnerable because nobody's looking out for them. The only people who are looking out for them are themselves. So we did a lot of work 
into Helen Charlton's background and some of the information that we uncovered was troubling uh, and of great interest. He'd had a couple of convictions which showed a, a bent that he had towards some very strange uh, behaviour, some dominant behaviour and all of these of course, all these facts that were being thrown up were red flags to us. The information provided by Idris Ali led to both Ali and Charlton charged on suspicion of murder. Information was also provided by Ali that brought police into contact with another crucial witness to events of that night. A young woman who had been Karen's friend, who was able to reveal exactly how Karen had died at the hands of the two men. She would become known as Witness D. And that young girl was 13 years of age at the time, I believe, and a friend of Karen's, and was also in the care system. Yes, that's right. There were conflicting accounts, but there were certain things that both Idris Ali and the Witness D were able to tell us, uh, which were consistent. Alan Charlton wanted some girls at the party. Idris Ali went to get them. And Ali, was he a Cardiff lad, Jeff? Yep, Cardiff born and bred, um, well known in, in, the, in the local community. He knows the places, he, he knows the people, um, he knows the area. So he was the perfect uh, foil, if you like, for, for Alan Charlton uh, to do a lot of his running around for him. One question remains. What drove Charlton to murder? As one of the country's leading forensic psychologists, Professor Paul Britton has helped the police in over 300 murder investigations. He is particularly interested in the dynamic between Charlton and Ali, along with their means and method of murder. Alan Charlton is a man who uses his bulk, who uses his assertiveness to push people to do what he wants. And remember, there's an egocentricity here, and the idea is that what I want, you must do. And if you don't do what I want, I'm going to make you. Charlton wanted her to be involved in certain sexual activity with another girl that he was going to photograph, he was going to require certain sorts of things, and she didn't particularly want to do that. And if there's one thing that Charlton can't tolerate, it's resistance, because that threatens who and what he is. And it was when Alan Charlton spoke to Karen to ask her to take her clothes off because he wanted to take photographs uh, that she resisted. Uh, Witness D certainly tells us, as does Idris Ali, he struck her. And as a result of that, she never moved when she'd hit the floor. So it was clearly quite a frightening blow that Charlton had, um, had rained on her. Whilst I'm surprised at how much information we did manage to uncover, it's also quite clear that we only have the account of uh, Witness D uh, and Idris Ali as to what went on in that room. Whether there was more that went on than they told us, we will never know, unfortunately. But what we do know is that Karen met a very uh, gruesome death. Like so many killers who murder in rage, Charlton panicked when it came to getting rid of Karen's body. I think the disposal shows several things. I think it shows a slightly amateurish attitude because she wasn't, if you like, disposed of a good way off where, if she was found, it's going to be more difficult to track where she came from. She was rolled in a carpet and buried in a shallow grave. So we want to get it out of the way now. Probably didn't think it was going to be discovered easily, and indeed it wasn't. And it comes to my mind, Jeff, that she could still be laying there to this day. Yeah, it's, it does make you think. Uh, it just so happens that they were carrying out that work at that time and that's the only reason that she was found. If that work hadn't been done then or since, then she could still be there. 
she is one of those people who, as far as the system is concerned, had fallen off the world. Folks weren't looking. She's gone, she hasn't been found dead in a ditch. She's probably working the street somewhere. She may be in London. She's maybe gone off. She's making her way. It was her choice. And I think that's how she came to be where she was. The accounts of that fateful night as provided by Witness D would see both men committed to trial. In March 1991, Ten years after Karen's death, a guilty verdict was returned against Charlton and Ali. Charlton battered her to death because she wouldn't agree to nude photographs being taken. The judge, Mr Justice Rose, said the precise details of what he called this appalling murder would probably never be known. He praised the police for carrying out a complex and difficult case. Charlton was given a life sentence for the murder, but Ali's lawyers immediately challenged his conviction. After the case, Karen's father said he was very pleased with the verdicts. The whole affair had been very difficult. We thought she was married and had her own family and thought no more about it until this case came to light. But it's been sad for the family. At least that she's at rest and at peace and they got what they deserve. Whilst being held in custody, Ali's lawyers launched an appeal. Idris Ali's murder conviction was overturned by the Court of Appeal, but today he was given a six-year sentence for manslaughter. The expert opinion not given to the trial jury that his lack of intelligence lies within the bottom 5% of the population, bordering on a mental handicap. Ali would serve just three years of his sentence before being released for good behaviour. The Darkland team regrouped to share their thoughts on this landmark murder case. Um, we know Alan Charlton and Idris Ali uh, were found guilty of a murder and manslaughter. Um, but let's just start to summarise some of the key facts that we found in looking at the case, Paul. Yeah, and, and I think what's come out from relation to Karen's disappearance and then ultimate tragic murder, um, first of all, is how missing persons were dealt with. And we've got to look at 1981 and the risk assessments and all the management, the issues around that. The roles of different individuals within in the police service and the care service and the social services in relation to the management of particularly young people who go missing from care. And then you have the, the forensics, of course, a huge area that we've talked about, and in particular the discovery of, of Karen's body and that groundbreaking work, the, the facial reconstruction that was carried out. And that links in with the, the great partnership work that went on between the police and the media you know, and how, how that worked and how that led to the discovery and identity of, of Karen herself. It's such a sad um, thing that she was basically forgotten about for so long, that she didn't have this kind of strong, supportive network of family and friends who could fight for her um, and kind of keep her story in the press once she'd gone missing or even highlight that she'd gone missing. So you have this, this long gap of eight years before this 15-year-old is finally found and gets some attention in the press. Yeah, and for me, you know, a sobering thought in this case is uh, the discovery of uh, Karen's body. And had that construction work not been carried out, you know, little Karen would still be there in that shallow grave in the back of that garden, undiscovered, unheard of, you know, and forgotten about. Uh, and it does make you wonder, you know, these days with all the young people that do go missing and are unaccounted for still today, how many have, have, have led to this type of demise. And it's a really sad case really, isn't it, when you look at the detail behind it all and how her life played out in the short time that she was with us.